Good to see you today. Good morning. Uh, If you're joining us online, welcome as well. We are in a series that we started just last week. We actually have done this a few times now in the summer where we do, we look at heroes of the faith, kind of based on Hebrews 11 where it has a long list of some amazing people that uh, that live that are recorded in the Bible that are people of faith. We certainly can learn from them. It's, a, it's called running with the giants. They're giants of faith, but we can run alongside them. We certainly can learn a lot, and that's what we want to do today as we look at Daniel. Daniel in the lion's den, right? I mean, if you're if you were raised in church, some of you, uh, if you're older, you when you were raised from church, we used to use these these felt boards. <laughs> that's, uh, that's, <laughs> I don't know if I should be admitting that. There's a kind of a, uh, something that goes with that. But, uh, you know, but the problem is when, when uh, you hear some of these stories, this would be one that is commonly taught to little kids. And so Daniel, you know, it's kind of dumbed down to make it look kid-like, kid-friendly. So Daniel's a little kid, and there's like these lions that look like kittens, and, you know, and he's like snuggling up next to them. I don't think that's what it was. I think these were like man-eating lions. And, um, you know, it's a big deal. So I'm not that experienced with lions. I mean, I've I've been out camping, but I've never had a lion come at me or anything like that. I've had bobcats, you know, being uh, out in Arizona. And bobcats are small, and I still run. You know, it's certainly not a house cat. I'm, I think I'm more scared than, 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 than he is. I went to a zoo once that was uh, just lions. It was called Cattails in, uh, in Washington State. And so I went, they gave me some chicken, some raw chicken. I fed the lion. But, you know, I like that fence. That fence, <laughs> that fence that's a game changer. You know, a big fence, and I'm behind it, you know. So with Daniel, there was no fence. I mean, he's he's... Fed to the lions. He's thrown in the lion's den. How does that come about? Well, we're going to look at that in Daniel chapter 6. If you have your Bibles, you can open them up. We're going to kind of unpack a number of those verses today. Uh, If you have your Bible uh, app on your phone, you can open it up again. We'll be looking at that. We primarily look at uh, our verses through the NIV, and uh, that's the translation we like to use here. Well, King Darius was the king during Daniel. Daniel actually was very high up in the, in, in, in the government. And, and he had already served under uh, uh, two other kings previous. So this is his third king. King Darius, though, is this administrative genius, history tells us. And so he comes in when he becomes king, reorganizes, does a full reorganization, sets up 120 of what he called satraps, which were really like kingdom protectors. They had vital roles in, uh, in his cabinet. And then above the satraps were administrators. Only three of them. Daniel ends up getting elevated to one of these three administrators. Administrators were there to protect against rebellion. They were to levy taxes. They were also to guard uh, the financial affairs of the nation. They were really to help balance the, finan- the, the national checkbook. Wouldn't that be nice if we did that today? But, that's, you know, but that, that was important to them. So what I just told you, you will see as we drop right in to this chapter in Daniel chapter 6. It pleased Darius, that's King Darius, to appoint 120 satraps to rule throughout the kingdom. So these are kingdom protectors. They're part of his cabinet with three administrators over them, one of whom was Daniel. So this is Daniel. It's kind of remarkable because Daniel is a foreigner. They went and they 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 would subjugate uh, uh, other nations and then a few of them they would bring into their into their kingdom but they didn't know the culture they didn't know the language or anything. Here Daniel is able to go from that humble beginning and become uh, one of the top people in charge. Says the satraps were made accountable to them so that the king uh, might not suffer loss. So continuing, now Daniel so distinguished himself among the administrators and the satraps by his exceptional qualities that the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. So he's thinking, okay, I'm going to put him over everybody. He'll be second in charge 
You know, he'll even be over those administrators. Why? Because Daniel distinguished himself with this excellent spirit, these excellent qualities. One of the values we have here at Vineyard is to pursue excellence. Pursue excellence because we believe when we pursue excellence, it honors God, it honors God, it, it inspires people, but it helps you to get, you know, recognized. You kind of stand out from the crowd because most people are not pursuing excellence in their lives. And we want to pursue excellence not just in our career, but in our personal life, and our character, all of those things. And so he gets promoted. But you know, he gets promoted from the outside, but within the, it, the inside, the administrators, they're not all that happy. They're jealous. You know, not everybody's going to celebrate your success. When you do, have you figured that out? Something good happens to you. Not everybody's like, yay, you know, good for you. And so here he's, he's getting some pushback. But he's able to stand up under that because of his relationship with God. And it's not something that he just created. He, he's not a kid here. By this time, he's like in his 80s. So he has 80 decades of learning to serve God. And he learned some stuff in that, and that's stuff that we certainly can learn. Three truths to help you stand strong, particularly when under uh, uh, oppression, when God raises you up. People will tear you down. Just knowing that, that it's going to happen, it actually can be kind of encouraging because you know if you're, if you're not getting oppressed, if you're not getting pushed back, you may not be pushing hard enough doing the stuff you're supposed to be doing with your life because it's going to happen. What's that look like? Well, let's say you were to stand up for something that's controversial, right? And you put a stake in the ground. This is what the Bible says. I believe God. Maybe you put your faith in Christ, and you're all fired up. You're excited. You're sharing your faith with people. Not everybody's going to share your faith. Some people are going to say, calm down. Don't, don't be one of those Bible thumpers, you know? Don't, don't, don't be a zealot. Don't, and they'll, they, you get fired up for Jesus. Even well-meaning people will try to pull you down. Maybe you decide to do something that's counterculture. Maybe you downsize your house or your lifestyle or you, get out of, you choose to get out of debt or you quit your job and you decide, I'm going to be a stay-at-home parent. Not everybody's going to celebrate that. But you're saying, hey, this is, I sense God's wanting me to do this. God called me to do this. And you know what you'll get? Criticism. Because not, there's a lot of people that are not going to say, hey, I support that. And often it's people near us. You know, in, in the U.K., in Australia, they call it the tall poppy syndrome. That's their term for that. Where, you know, a poppy tree grows bigger than the other ones, and people will, they'll come in and they'll cut it down to bring it down to size because they don't, you know, they don't want all that shade, you know, making the other ones not be able to grow. We call it the crab mentality, right? You've heard that. Crab mentality. You know where that comes from? Well, you can YouTube it. Type in crab, it, not now. Please listen to me right now. <laughs> but later... Type in crab mentality in YouTube. You'll see that they have crabs in a bucket or crabs in a pot. And if one crab tries to get out, you think the other crabs are encouraging them? Like, hey, we'll help you, buddy. No. They grab his little legs and they rip him back down. If he tries it again, they actually start severing limbs off of the crab. Cut his claws off so he can't get out. Keeping him down. Some of you have people like that in your life. They don't want you to succeed. They're trying to keep you down. And so you're aware of that. Hey, I don't want to be part of that, and i gotta, I got to overcome that. That's what it means to over. So he didn't just have lions he was overcoming. He was overcoming these guys trying to pull him down. Look at what it says here. It says, at this, the administrators and the satraps tried to find grounds for charges against Daniel in his conduct of government affairs. He said, not all of them. A lot of people like Daniel. Some of them, though, crab mentality. They didn't want him to succeed. They're looking for dirt. Right? Somebody in politics today, they decided to throw their hat in the ring. I'm going to run local politics, regional, national. It doesn't really matter. First thing people do is they go, let's find some dirt on him. Let's find some, dig up something on this guy. Well, this is what they're trying to do. But look at what happens. It says, they could find no corruption in him. He's not perfect. But he's not corrupt. He hasn't done shady things. 
He doesn't have a bunch of skeletons in his closet. And so they're, they're trying to find stuff. You know, people will try to come up, and they'll, they'll even come up with lies against you. There's, there's nothing you can do about that. Here's what I've done, and I've, talked to, I've told you this before. You can't control the lies people say about you, but you can't control the truth. The, if it's true what they're saying, you have control over that. If it's lies, hey, people will come up. Well, so anyways, they're trying to do anything they can because he was trustworthy and neither corrupt nor negligent. Finally, these men said, well, we will never find any basis for charges against this man, Daniel, unless it has something to do with the law of his God. So they think, okay, if we're going to dig up something, you know, we're going to have to, it's going to have to be associated with his spiritual life. And so they devise a plot. They're going to come up with a plot where they think, okay, because uh, they knew Daniel was a spiritual man. He was also a leader. And as a leader, we often live, I'm not just talking about me, as Christ followers, as you, as people who don't know the Lord are looking at your life, there's a certain level of transparency we have, to, we, we have. so people can, can uh, learn what it means to be a Christ follower. And if you are a leader, small group leader, you lead, uh, you're, a, you're a team leader in, with our dream teams, or you're a coach or a captain, we have leaders in our church then there's even more need for openness, transparency. This is what Daniel, Daniel's the top guy. And so one of the things he did, he didn't do it just because he's the top guy. He had been doing it, like I said, for decades, where he prayed three times a day. I'm sure he prayed more than that. He probably just thought to himself, I need at least three. Uh, start the engines, you know, morning, noon, and night. I need, I need Jesus through the whole deal, you know. I need God through the whole thing. And so he's, but he's facing opposition. And I think that in, sometimes in Western Christianity, we think that if there's opposition, maybe we're doing something wrong. That's our go-to. I must be doing something wrong. No, no, you're actually probably doing something right. Well, wait a minute. I serve God and, uh, you know, I read the Bible and I serve other people in Jesus' name and I pray and my marriage is not doing well. Well, maybe the enemy's attacking that area. You know, the easiest way to take out somebody is attack their family. And Satan knows that. So that's why we need to be even more vigilant with our home life, with our family, with our relationship with our spouse, with our kids. There's no sacred ground there to the devil. He's happy to come in and try to harass you however he can. And so sometimes when we're advancing the kingdom of God, we need to expect some pushback. There's going to be opposition, even from well-meaning people. People you think, you know, how can this be coming from you? But you know what? Devil can use people. Peter said that. Remember that? I don't. If you're familiar with his Gospels, Jesus, Peter comes up and says, "Hey, maybe you shouldn't be crucified." You know what Jesus' response was? He looks at him. He goes, "Get behind me, Satan!" Satan's using Peter. Peter's the, one, of the, one of the disciples, becomes the, the, the rock of the church. And yet Satan even used that well-meaning person. We, there's people, Satan has, will use anybody. So you just got to be careful of that. Here's what you need to know. If you're not ready to face opposition for your obedience to God, you're not ready to be used by God. It's par for the course. It comes with it. You're going to start to move the needle for the glory of God, you can expect opposition. Daniel certainly got opposition. Opposition. These guys, they, so their plan is, they, they, they go to the king, and they're going to, now king, he, they, first they butter him up. You can kind of read between the lines. I don't know how you butter up a king, but hey, king, Darius, you look really, you know, you look buff, man, in that robe. You know, wow, those, those, Birkenstock sandals look great on you, you know, I, I don't know. Whatever you do for a king, but they butter them up. And then, and kings like that, kings, you know, kings, they, they, they get kind of arrogant and they see themselves. They know they're not God, but they like to be treated like God. And so that's what they, they appeal to. They say, you know what, we know you're God, king. And so what we think everybody should 
worship you and pray only to you for 30 days. They knew that's all it needed for, for Daniel. 30 days. And they knew that Daniel prayed publicly. And so they thought, well, da Daniel's lion's lunch. Now, da Daniel did not know how this was going to roll out. He didn't know that for centuries and centuries he would be a cool Sunday school lesson, you know, of God, you know, protecting him in the lines. He didn't know. But he's a man of prayer, and, and he thinks, I'm going to stand regardless. But they have a law. If you're known to be a praying person, you'll get thrown into this lion's den. What if they had a law like that today? Would you be afraid? Would you be concerned? Mm. Or are you protected? Mm. I don't pray. You know, I don't pray. And the, by the way, the most dangerous prayers, if I had to give up my prayer, if I, you know, I have my prayer life, like all of us, you know, most of us do, right? If I had to give up prayers, you know, the first ones that would go for me would be my mealtime prayers. They're, they're, you know, Lord bless, except for if I'm visiting like a third world country, then it's a valuable prayer. You know, Lord, I don't want to get sick today. Please help me. But other than that, that's kind of a fluffy prayer. But listen, we need to come to God in prayer. Seek God in prayer. It's God, I need you in this moment. Now, Daniel really had three options. One is he could have just stopped praying. I better take a month off. Things kind of getting dicey around here. God will understand. He knows I've been doing this for eight decades. Or fake it. Pray silently. You know, who are you praying to? Well, you know, King Darius, but in, but in my mind, I'm, you know. God will understand or keep praying publicly to God and risk everything. Now, that's some faith there. That's faith to step out and do that. And that's exactly what Daniel did. Two, kneeling to pray gives you the strength to stand up. Gives, when we, the lower we go, it, the higher God goes in our heart and in our mind. There's something powerful about prayer. Prayer. Now, notice we get to see a little bit of Daniel's prayer life. Now, when Daniel learned that the decree that anybody who didn't, who, who didn't worship the king would be thrown into the lion's den had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where the windows were open towards Jerusalem. Three times a day, he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to his God just as he had done before. He didn't just start this. It's something was baked into his life to help him through, because this is not his first challenge. He's been through other challenges before, and he knew the value of prayer. Prayer is not an obligation. Prayer is a privilege. We get to go before God because of what Jesus did for us. There was a barrier that when we kind of sense, oh, I don't really sense very, being very, that's a real barrier. That got destroyed through what Christ did on the cross for us. So it's, we get to walk in boldly, courageously, into the throne room of God, the creator and the sustainer of the universe. I love this translation out of the Passion, uh, out of Hebrews. It says, so now we draw near freely and boldly to where grace is enthroned. He's talking about prayer, going to God in prayer, to receive grace mercy's kiss and discover the grace we urgently need to strengthen us in our time of weakness going before God humbling ourselves God delights in that he loves to be close to you to us he wants that communication he wants that closeness the intimacy and he wanted that from Daniel Daniel didn't just do it for show. Like, you know, Jesus talked about the hypocrites. They, they're just doing stuff for show. He one time takes a jab. Pharisees were known for that. He'd say, whenever you pray, be sincere and not like the pretenders, the Pharisees who love the attention they receive while praying before others in the meetings on the street corners. It's not like Daniel opened up the windows and said, I'm going to just do whatever I want. I'm not going to listen to King Darius hashtag I'm so spiritual you know <laughs> look at me now he had always been doing that this was how he 
modeled his prayer life before God and before other people because he was a leader and he understood the value. There's other people that are watching. And when he stood up, that gave them courage as well. So he's a role model. Now, how, how do you do that? Does that just like come out of nowhere? No. It comes from decision after decision after decision. Just, over, just line upon line, precept upon precept. Building your life up so that when you're strong, it comes from years of good decisions. We see this in Daniel's life. Daniel made a decision early on when he was younger. They offered these young men, he was one of these young men, this incredible buffet of food to eat every day. If you're going to get a young guy, that's how you do it, right? And everybody knows you want young guys to show up at a party, make sure there's free food. And they're there, and he's offering them all this amazing food. He stands up and he goes, no, I'm not going to do it. I'm going to eat the way God wants me to eat. And he stands up against the king. And then there's some dreams that happen, Nebuchadnezzar and Belshazzar, and the, you know, that, that the dreams that he has to interpret are actually like rebukes. So he has to say, well, here's what God's saying. You messed up, king. And in one case, he goes, you're, you're going to die. I mean, he stood up with conviction, with commitment to God in his and his interpretation of dreams, and then his courage, when, I mean, by saying, you messed up to a king. Stands before God. How did that happen? Because he learned years ago to bow, stand before a man because he bowed before God. His, the posture matters. Now, on Saturday mornings, we have our pray first service. Every Saturday morning, 9 to 10. And I encourage you to come. You know, just it's New Testament prayer. We just come, we pray, we seek God. It's, it's incredible. God speaks all the time. If you have a prayer request, you put it on the, uh, the, the, connection, the connection card that we provide for you. We'll be praying. We pray for those. We pray for those Saturday morning. We pray for them other times, but we certainly pray for them then. But we pray. And one of the things I like to do, I mean, I just want to get low. In, in, in my spirit, but also physically. I get on my knees. Sometimes I need, I'm just, there's so much going on. I need, I, sometimes I'm just sucking carpet. God, I need you. I need you. You, you know, the lower I get, in my, in, and there's a physical part to it, but it's about, it's really more about my heart. Lord, I need you. I need you to come through. And we have, and, and God gives us courage, and we need courage. You need courage to, do the right thing at work. To do the right thing in your neighborhood. You maybe if you're a parent and your kid likes soccer and you're thinking, oh, if I put them in the soccer league, you know, they might really do what? But it means that we really don't go to church a whole lot anymore. And you take a stand and say, I'm not going to do that. Parenting is a, is a responsibility ultimately and first and foremost before God that I raise these kids as God would want me to raise them. That doesn't sound like that's a good spiritual decision that I'm sowing into my kids. Or you, maybe you have a boyfriend. He's pressuring you to compromise on, on some of the purity of your heart. And so you decide, I don't want to go there. I'm going to end this. Or there's a business deal that you know has got some shady things to it. And it's compromising your integrity. And so you go, I'm not going to do that. Even though I'll miss out on my profits and my promotion and maybe my job. It takes courage to do the right thing today. And Daniel didn't know how it was going to end. He didn't know if he'd get eaten. And honestly, we don't know how, you know, it'll end when we make decisions like that. Your kid might not get the soccer scholarship that you were hoping for because you pulled him out of that. That, that one league. You, you might not get another boyfriend for a while when you drop the one that was pressuring you to compromise the purity of your heart. You, you might lose your job or not get the promotion. I mean, there are consequences sometimes, but we trust God is going to look after us. We say, God, I, because that's what Daniel did. And you predetermine it. You predetermine it up front. I'm going to serve God. I'm going to be committed to God. I am going to have courage with God. I am going 
to put God first. Number three, when you do what is right, you can always trust God with the results. You can always trust him. Now, sometimes it doesn't happen the way we would like it to happen. You know, fairy tale ending. This is, we're not living a Disney movie, folks. Right? This is real life. Nothing wrong with Disney, but there's fantasy and then there's reality. And sometimes in reality, it's not the way we wanted it to roll out. But you stay committed regardless. Daniel didn't know how it was going to happen, but he just knew, I'm Dan the man, and I'm going to be faithful. That's, I'm, I'm going to be faithful. Now, now Darius, when, when he felt like Darius couldn't get out of it, even though he helped make the law, it's kind of like some of the laws of our land once they get ratified in Congress, and then they go before the Supreme Court. I mean, there's a, there's a point when there's, it's the law now. No, everybody has to obey that law, and that's kind of what had happened here. And Daniel's thrown into the lines. He's so upset. He feels devastated because he liked him. He feels mad. He's tricked. He feels deceived by, by these people that were supposed to be loyal to him. It says, then the king returned to his palace and spent the night. This is, now, Daniel is in the lion's den. They cover it up and, uh, and spent the night without eating and without any entertainment. He, he couldn't even sleep. He's all upset because of what had happened. And we don't really know exactly how the lions, why the lions didn't eat Daniel. We just know that God shut their mouths. They shut their, but as far as we know, Daniel maybe barked like a dog or maybe found a whip like, you know, Indiana Jones. I don't know. You know, I mean, we don't know. Maybe he, maybe he just whimpered and, and wet his pants. That's probably what I would do. I'm, that's kind of what I did do. I've never been surrounded by lions, but I was a number of years ago. I guess about eight years ago. I was surrounded by, by barracuda, great barracuda. I was, my wife and I were down in the Caribbean. Uh, we were, I, was, I was by myself. She goes, I, I don't want to go. So I was out there, and I'm snorkeling. And uh, I see, and the water super clear. And I see way off in the distance a few, like, fish that don't look very friendly. Next thing I know, I mean, it's like instantaneously, I am surrounded with great barracuda. And they're like sideways, because that's how they show themselves. Like, like, like They're like, we're not happy, we're going to eat you type look, you know. <laughs> and I look, and I'm not a fish expert, but I get up, and I can see, they're so close to me, I can see their face. I'm thinking, I mean, they look snarling me. They don't have lips, their teeth are always showing. Like, and they kind of look angry. I, you know, it's, they were born that way. That's their, gift. That's their gift, their spiritual gift. And it's a wall of them. I mean, maybe, I don't know, 15 feet of water. And from, I mean, there's got to be, I don't, they're great barracuda, so they're huge, and they've surrounded me. So I think, I don't think I'm that delicious. It must be my ring. So I hide my wedding band. So I'm committed to my marriage, but, you know. There's limits, right? I mean, this is a this piece of gold. I can get another one. Uh, hope. Anyway, so I hide my wedding band. I swim at the fish, and they close ranks. They're not scared of me at all. They're like, you look delicious. <laughs> and I got terrified. I just thought, I'm going to die. I can't, they're not going to let me out. I'm stuck. So I just paused for a second. I prayed, Lord, get me out of this. Now, that's a valuable prayer. That's, that, that prayer is important to me. You know, Lord, help, help me to live through this. So that I, I, I'm holding on to my wedding bands so they don't see it. And I peek out and I see a couple, I don't know, maybe 50 yards away or so. They're, 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 they're a good distance. And it turns out I met them later. They were, they were on their honeymoon. So I yell out. I say, hey, can you come swim over to me? <laughs> Like you would probably do. They go, why? <laughs> I said, well, I'm surrounded by great bar barracuda. And I heard the woman say real softly, because, you know, it travels over the water. She goes, no, let's not do it. Let's not do it. <laughs> Fortunately, he ignored her. <laughs> and, he, and, and he swims, but she follows him, but he swims over to me. And then, um, and then I look down, they're gone. Can't see him as far as I can. I think, oh, Lord, thank you. But I was so scared. It's, it's terrifying when you have wild, unknown animals surrounding you. Well, Daniel's got these 
lions that want to eat him. And so God shuts the mouths of the lions. First thing Darius does in the morning, he says, at the first light, the king got up and hurried to the lion's den. When he came near to the den, he called to Daniel in anguish voice, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God whom you serve continually. It's not something. He's seen this in his, this guy's life for years. Has he been able to rescue you from the lion? My God sent his angel, and he shut the mouth of the lions. They have not hurt me because I was found innocent in his sight, nor have I ever done any wrong before you. Your majesty, the king, was overjoyed and gave orders to lift Daniel out of the den. That's an amazing story. Why? Because, he, you know, he, he didn't know exactly how, what would happen, but he knew, I'm going to trust God through it. And when Daniel was lifted from the den, no wound was found on him because he had trusted in his God. You trust God with the results. Regardless of what happens, I'm trusting you. Now, evidently, the angels from guarding Daniel all night were tired because King Darius throws the, those other guys that falsely accused him and made him look bad into the den, and um, they became lion's lunch. At the king's command, the men who had falsely accused Daniel were brought in and thrown into the lion's den, along with their wives and their children. He's, he's upset. This guy's like raging out. And before they reached the floor of the den, the lions overpowered them and crushed all of their bones. So when we face opposition, like Daniel did, we have a choice. We have a choice. First thing we have to recognize, whenever God's hand is on you, whenever you're going to stand up for something, you're going to get a pushback. And we have lions. Now, granted, you know, you go, well, I don't see too many lions around here. Oh, yeah? You have lions in your life that are threatening to, to, to disrupt you, to destroy your family, to, to cause you to do poorly at work, to rip apart your relationships, to destroy your health, all kinds of things. And God, we learn from here that, hey, God's going to be, he's going to watch over us. Our job is to stand our ground with God, trusting him. Hey, God, I'm going to give you my very best. You know, in the, um, yesterday in, in Saturday morning prayer, God, I knew I was, I was going to be speaking on this, and so I was praying over the message, and God gave me kind of a vision of some other lion episodes in the Bible. Benaniah is one, and uh, King David, David fought a lion. Both of those guys killed their lions. Daniel, though, had to just do stand up and stay, you know, be encouraged. He didn't kill the lions. He had to endure it. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, Whenever we have temptation, God gives us either the ability to overcome or the ability to endure. Some of you have lions in your life. You're supposed to overcome them and, and take them down. Others of you, you have a lion in your life that your season right now is that you endure. You stand your ground. And God will be there for you. I love this, this uh, statement, I, this poem I came across this week. We'll close with this. It's called The Fellowship of the Unshamed. I think Daniel's story is um, so well summarized in it for us here. It says, my pace is set, my gate is fast, my goal is heaven, my road is narrow, my way is rough, my companions few, my guide is reliable, my mission clear. I cannot be bought, compromised, detoured, lured away, turned back, deluded, or delayed. My past is redeemed. My present makes sense, and my future is secure. I am finished and done with low living, small planning, smooth knees, colorless dreams, tame visions, worldly talking, cheap giving, and dwarfed goals. I no longer need preeminence, prosperity, position, promotions, or platitudes. I don't have to be right, first, tops, reorganized, praised, or excuse me, recognized, praised, regarded, or rewarded. 
I will not flinch in the face of sacrifice, hesitate in the presence of adversity, negotiate at the table of the enemy, ponder at the pool of popularity, or meander in the maze of mediocrity. I won't give up, back down, let up, or shut up until I've preached up, prayed up, paid up, stored up, and spoken up for the cause of Christ. I am a disciple of Jesus Christ. I must go until he returns, give until I drop, preach until all know, and work until he stops me. And when he comes to get his own, he will have no problem recognizing me. My colors will be clear. That is my prayer for you. That's my prayer for me. Let's bow our heads and pray. With every head bowed, every eye closed, just take this moment right now. This is your moment to come before the creator and sustainer of the universe. Some of you, God has risen you up. You've gotten places of position and blessing. And you've had, you've experienced that. Maybe some of you are in that where people are trying to tear you down. Rob your joy. God wants you to see past those people because there is a spiritual demonic influence that's behind that. And that's part of the reason we kneel in prayer. We kneel before God and then he gives us strength to stand. Listen, you might have a lion that looks like a wayward child or some kind of business thing that's falling apart. Maybe it's just internal. There's a constant unsettledness in your spirit, in your in your life. You're filled with anxiety and worry. That is a lion that will try to rob you of what God's best is for you. There's all kinds of opposition. And I believe this is a true story. It's not a fable. This is a true story of God's protective power. And it's true for you. God has a miracle, just like he did for Daniel and other people. This is your moment, your time. You don't know how it's going to turn out, just like Daniel did. But you leave the results to God. Now you might be here, or you be online with me. So, you know, Andy, I don't really feel worthy. I've done some, some ugly things, some bad things. I've not really been following. I know better. But, you know, Christ died on the cross for you. That is why he was on the cross. He lived the perfect life. He didn't need to go to the cross. He endured that punishment of sin all kinds of sin placed on him on that cross so that you don't have to. Your pathway to being close with God, to receiving favor from God, to getting that new beginning, that fresh start, is through going to God and asking for forgiveness. It's not because he wants you to grovel, it's because he wants you to stand. He wants you to stand with conviction, with commitment, with courage. This is a specific moment in time that you are here. God's speaking to you. God knew you'd be here before you were even born because he wanted to communicate a message to you that you matter to him, that he loves you, he cares about you. And this is your moment. I'm going to ask you to pray to God. I want to lead you in a prayer, actually right where you're at. I'm not going to ask you to come forward, to stand up. This isn't about committing to Vineyard Church. This is about you committing to God. Saying, God, I want you first place in my life. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for what he did on the cross. I want that newness of life. And I'm going to ask you to pray. If that's you, with every head bowed, every eye closed, 
You're saying, Andy, I want to do that. I'm ready to make that decision. I want to get right with God. I want to follow him. Then I'm going to ask you to let me know that you want to pray with me. You can do that just with boldly right now. Just put your hand up so I can see it. Everybody, there you go. Anybody else? Okay. Yep. This is your moment. Your life matters. I'm going to give you just a few more moments. Yep, I see you in the back. Several of you up over here on the side. In the back and on the side. This is, okay. Okay, but you can put your hand down. Pray with me now. I saw that hand. Pray with me if you would. Say, dear God, today is my day. I ask for your forgiveness. For my obstinate heart. For doing things that I know you don't want me to do with my mind, with my body. Sometimes I've even had my fist sh shaking at heaven. And today I want to surrender all of that. You see, I invite your Holy Spirit to come and renew me. Take care of those lions in my life. I surrender those to you. Lord, you do a work. I can't do it on my own strength. You say, God, give me a clear conscience. Fill my life up with joy and purpose. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Would you welcome those who are born into the family of God today? We're so glad that you're here. Those of you who, joined, who prayed that prayer online, let me know about it. You can say, I prayed with you. I raised my hand. If you raised your hand or you want prayer, let me know about that. The Connect card that's in front of you, also the QR code, leads you to the same place. We'd love to hear from you so we can pray for you. I want to specifically know and pray for you if you prayed with me to receive Christ. Say, yes, I prayed that prayer. You can put that, if you fill out the physical card, we have some boxes on the, mounted on the side wall as you leave. You can put those in there. They will come directly to me. You know, your next step, God always has us on a journey with the next step. Your next step, if you're new with us or you prayed a prayer to receive Christ, is, is growth track. And we're, we have step one today, perfect time. It's only about 50 minutes long. And we'll feed you, watch your kids if you have kids. As you're leaving, you'll see a sign there that says growth track. You can step right in. If today you can't make it, uh, we do it every month, every week of every month, because that's how important it is. And each week we do step one or step two, step three, step four, uh, depending on the, the week of the month. We'd love to have you in there. Also, another place where we gain a lot of strength and encouragement is in small groups. We have our small group semester that just, just started. Love to have you be part of that. And we're gonna, it's a shorter semester, and we end by doing a great event together called Serve Day where we serve our community. And that's just uh, in about five weeks or six weeks. Love to have you be part of that as well. Okay, well, if you would, would you stand with me? If you would like to give to, and, and help advance uh, the gospel uh, financially here, we would love to have your support, especially if, you've, if you consider this your church home. If you're new, you're a guest, we're just glad that you're here. If, you're, if this is your church home, we, we, we certainly uh, would love to partner with you financially as well. In fact, what we like to do is on the first Sunday of every month is pray over the offering and pray over you, those of you who give uh, to our church. So we're going to do that as we transition to this final song. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we pray for your presence, Lord, to come. Lord, I pray for each person who gives and supports and advances the gospel. Lord, you bless that like the fishes and loaves. Multiply that. You say in Malachi that those who tithe, those who give faithfully, that the floodgates of heaven will open up, that a, a, a blessing will pour out more than we can contain, that you prevent pests from devouring our crops and the vines of our field will become abundant so that we can be uh, a witness to the nations around us. Lord, I pray more of you, more of your favor. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.